called this message today the foundation of our faith. So as I stand here on a Sunday morning, it's good to see those of you who are here. A lot of you sit in the same spot week after week, and so it's easy to notice those places where there isn't someone when someone is mis missing. But there's also places in this congregation, in, the, in, in our auditorium here, where people used to sit, those who passed away, the ones who used to be a part of us, the people from the past. And I'm going to mention some today that, that have passed on since I've been here. This is just since I've been here. Pete Dirksen was the first one. I didn't know Pete real well, but I enjoyed visiting with him, and I remember visiting with him on his front porch a number of times. And he passed away soon after I started here in 2004. Mr. Pankratz used to sit right over there. I got to know him very well, visited with him a lot. He told me many of the stories of his life. And he's been gone since 2006. He was 96 years old. David Margaret Bickert used to sit just where, where Darlene and Doug are right now. We often had meals, shared meals together, either at their house or at our house. It was good fellowship. Margaret was one who would often discuss the sermon with me afterwards. I just loved that. And she's been gone since 2011. And Dave lives up at the Roster Nursing Home right now. Loretta Clark used to sit right around that area as well. Got, we, I got to know her when she had lung cancer. And she attended very regularly here at church for, uh, for a, a couple of years. Saw her grow in faith in Jesus. And she's been gone since 2011. Justin Andres had left Eyebrow before I came, but he grew up in this church. And I remember, remember how he'd be, he'd be here with us sometimes when he'd be home for a visit. And I especially remember the Thanksgiving Sunday that he was here, the year that he passed away. And that Sunday we wrote on strips of, of construction paper, things that we were thankful for, and we put them together into a chain. And, uh, and he was a part of that, writing down what he was thankful for. He's been gone since 2011. Abe and Sadie used to sit right back where, where Ron and Nancy are. I enjoyed visiting with them. They used to say that I would smell the homemade bread from my house because I would often show up at their place to visit and Sadie would have made homemade bread. Abe loved the farm and hated having to move to Moose Jaw. And Abe has been gone since 2014 and Sadie lives in Moose Jaw now too. Ruth Dirksen used to sit right back in that area as well. Got to know Ruth better in the last years of her life. Uh, one thing I remember is Ruth telling children's stories. And they were stories about birds, as I recall, bird families, and she used a flannel graph board. She's been gone since 2016. Edith Erickson also sat back in that area right around there. Got to know her because of her cancer. And we supported her over the years through the good times and the hard times. And Edith's faith in God grew stronger and stronger as her body grew weaker. She loved being part of this church family. And she's been gone since 2017. Then there was Darren. Darren so full of life. Loved working with the kids at Joe's place. Loved renovating furniture at MCC. He loved Vanessa and his family. He loved to tell people about Jesus. I especially remember Baptism Day. What a wonderful, glorious day that was. And I remember marrying you guys. That was a wonderful, glorious day as well. One th thing I also remember about Darren is that he was writing his faith story so that he would remember it and so he could share it more readily and more easily with other people. He's been gone now for seven months. Those are ones since I've been here. And you remember many others from the years before. Family members, friends from the community and beyond, loved ones who are now gone. Saints of Jesus Christ. We don't usually call people saints. In the Catholic Church, if you've done certain things, then you're designated as a saint. And that's usually well after you've died. 
But Paul often called followers of Jesus Christ saints in his letters. He wrote to the saints in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Jesus Christ at Philippi. Saints aren't only those who have passed away. We are saints. We who have accepted Jesus' call to follow me and faithfully desire to live for him. This morning I want to speak from two scriptures that are foundational scriptures of faith and they're, founda- they're scriptures that we stand on. Scriptures that keep us firm and solid in our Lord Jesus Christ. The first one is from 1 Corinthians 15. Paul writes, Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried that he was raised again on the third day according to the scriptures and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that he appeared to more than 500 at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, that's the brother of Jesus, then to all the apostles, and last of all he appeared to me also as one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of Jesus Christ. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace for me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it was I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believed. Paul reminds the Christians, the Christians in Corinth, of the gospel that they've heard, the gospel that they've accepted, the gospel on which they've taken their stand. He says this is what's of first importance. This is most important. It's the very foundation of their faith. Jesus died for our sins. Jesus was buried. Jesus rose again. And Jesus appeared. And he mentions some. He mentions Peter and the 12 and 500 others. These are foundational truths that we hang on to as we live our lives of faith. And this is the gospel message that we believe. And it's a message that we keep reminding ourselves of over and over and over again, especially through difficult times, especially through times of sickness and hardship and death. And Paul writes that by this gospel you were saved, by this gospel you've taken your stand, and this is part of our resurrection faith. And Paul says that Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried. He was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Now, according to the scriptures doesn't mean the New Testament. They didn't have a New Testament in those days. The canon of the New Testament came to be much later. The only texts that they had were the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament. And that, those, that Old Testament that they had in, the, in those scrolls told of God's plan right from the very beginning to bring creation and all people back to himself. And in Genesis chapter 3, we read how the serpent tempted Adam and Eve, and they sinned against God, and then all creation suffered the consequences of their sin. And in chapter 3, God curses the the serpent, and he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his feet. And as we follow God's story through scripture, we see over and over again how God acts, how God speaks to bring about the fulfillment of his plans from the very beginning. We're going to be starting the first Sunday of Advent next week. And we'll hear scriptures from the Old Testament, how God will send a Messiah. He's going to send a Savior who will usher in God's reign and new creation, who's going to make all things right again and make a way for humanity to be brought back into relationship with God. And when Jesus is born, that old serpent, the devil, tries hard to get rid of him. 
Herod kills all the baby boys in the area of Bethlehem to try to get rid of him. In the wilderness, Satan tempts Jesus to worship him, to take an easier path than following the ways of God. And on Good Friday, it looks like that old serpent like Satan has won. Jesus dies on the cross, and that serpent has struck his heel. And for three long days, Jesus' followers hide in disbelief and in sorrow and in fear. They don't know what to do. And then comes the glorious Easter, and Jesus is alive, and that serpent's head is crushed. And they see him alive. They see J and James, his brother, sees him, and many others see him. And Paul, who persecuted the church, took them to prison, tried to have them killed for the sharing the good news that Jesus is alive. Per Paul has a personal encounter with the risen Christ, and his life is completely changed. And Paul writes that it's all because of the grace of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, his grace reached out to him and drew him in. And a new day has come. And it's all according to scripture. My pastor friend, Garth Ewart Fisher, who has pastors in a church in uh, Saskatoon, says, God wins. And I like that. When I heard him say that, I listened to his sermon twice this past week. He said, God wins. He says, as Christians, we can confidently assert that history is decisively in God's hands. And we can forget that so easily. And we can get bogged down with what's getting on, going on around us. But God has won. That serpent's head has been crushed. Death isn't the end. It's actually just the beginning. And just as Jesus died and rose to new life again, those who've fallen asleep in Christ will rise again one day too with brand new bodies. We will be raised in glory. We will be raised with spiritual bodies. Bodies that are similar in some way to what we have now but more glorious. And I had to think, and, 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 uh, and, uh, and later on in 1 Corinthians 15, it talks about this. It talks about Jesus was born as a human child. He was born like us. Someday, we're going to bear his image, his resurrected image. And we're going to have those new resurrected bodies. And it's a mystery. Paul struggles in that chapter 15 to put into words what he's trying to say. And I encourage you to read 1 Corinthians 15. It's a glorious chapter trying to explain what is going to happen someday. And in verse 54 at the end, after trying to describe it, Paul says, death has been swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your, st your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death. And the law gives sin its power. But thank God he gives us victory over sin and death through Jesus Christ our Lord. And again, as I read those verses this week, I had to think that old serpent, he tries to strike our heels too. But his power has been defeated. We miss those who've gone from this earth. We wish they were still with us. And we grieve. And grieving is good. As I mentioned earlier, Jesus grieved with Mary and Martha when his dear friend Lazarus died. He grieves with us as we struggle to find our way in life without those that we love. But we don't grieve as those without hope. We hang on to God's promises that we will be united with Jesus one day and we will be united with our loved ones forever. And we remember the lives of those who've gone on before us these saints of God. And we remember their faith and their hope in the Lord. I was drawn to Hebrews 11 this week. That hall of faith. People like Abraham and Moses and Rahab and David and Samuel. And I thought the lives of our loved ones who have passed on could be added in that chapter as well. Stories of faith. Our loved ones weren't perfect. But neither were Abraham and Moses and David. But they all lived lives of faith in Jesus. And in verse 16, 
in, in Hebrews 11, it says, God is not ashamed be, to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. And we can look at these heroes of faith in Hebrews 11, and we can look at our loved ones who've gone to be with the Lord, and we can be encouraged to live faithfully with our God, who is making all things new as they did. We can imitate their faith as they walked with God. As I was thinking about this, I thought of Lena. Lena said one time to me, the doctors haven't given her much time. It's not what she wants. But she said, I know I'm going to go and be with the Lord. I think of Darren, who was writing his faith story so he could more readily share it with others. I think of Edith, who grew stronger and stronger in faith as her body grew weak, weaker and we could mention so many others. All were imperfect, but they are also a testimony to us of God's faithfulness. Examples of faith through good and hard times. May we remember in tears and in gratitude our wonderful God, who in Jesus Christ will one day draw us together into his glorious presence. And may these people this great cloud of witnesses that surround us, spur us on to also stand firm in faith, always giving ourselves faithfully and fully to our Lord Jesus. To him be glory and honor forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you so much for the encouragement of scriptures. Lord, these scriptures that were written 2,000 years ago, and yet they speak to us today. They draw us in to who you are and what you have done. They draw us in as we look at the lives of those who, whose stories are rec recorded in scripture. Imperfect people like us, and yet who followed you faithfully through those difficult and hard times. And Lord, we think of our loved ones. And we think of their faithful lives lived for you amongst the struggle of daily life. And Lord, Paul mentions and tells people to imitate me as I imitate Christ. And Lord, as I think of so many loved ones who have went on to be with you, that we also can imitate their lives as they imitated Christ. I thank you for the cloud of witnesses that are closer to our time, that we can think of, that we can remember. We're just so thankful for them. We're thankful for your promises, O oh God, that we hang on to, that firm foundation on which we can stand that as they've committed their lives to you, they are also with you. And that we will one day, how glorious it will be when we come into your presence. And we see them as well. Thank you so much for that, O oh God. Again, I pray that you will bring comfort and hope. That you will heal us, O oh God. And I thank you for the way that you guide us in your way, even as we struggle. Lord, I pray that as we go out into this week, that we may again share the goodness, the love, and the grace of Jesus Christ with those around us in our words and in our actions. And Lord, as you have blessed us in so many ways, I pray that we may share that blessing and be a blessing to others around us. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.